Good morning, Senators Ruth Hassel Thompson, Liz Kruger, Bill Perkins, and Gustavo Rivera, and also John Sampson. My name is Lady Catherine Williams Julian, and I am a domestic violence survivor and an HIV advocate. I'm testifying here today <coughs> to speak about the importance of the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act and how many lives will be empowered by it. Please allow me to share a little of my story. I met my husband, Maxwell, when I was eight years old, and I was 15 when we got married. One year later, I gave birth to our child, our first child. The marriage to me was grand. I had the perfect husband, the perfect father, the perfect family, which I thought. Maxwell became my entire world. He became my everything. I gained all of my self-worth. I thought it came from this man. We were together for 18 years. The abuse started when we both lost our jobs on the same day. We came home and we drank, which led to arguing. He was suddenly twisting my arm and hitting me, and I didn't know why. I saw my dad hit my mom. I also witnessed my father-in-law beat my mother-in-law. So in my interpretation, it was okay for a husband to hit his wife. The abuse started mostly when we were drinking. And once he got another job, he told me I would become a housewife, and I agreed. The violence became more frequent then. I was content with being a housewife for almost three years, but then I wanted to go back to school. He told me I couldn't. I disobeyed him, I took the exam, and I got in. One day at school, he showed up in the parking lot, and he pulled my dress all the way down, and he embarrassed me in front of everyone. I was scrambling, trying to hide behind cars so no one could see me. It was humiliating. You get used to patterns of violence if you don't know that this is unhealthy. I was eventually able to tell from his behavior when he was going to become violent. His voice would become raised, he would begin to use profanity, and then there would be hitting. He also started to say a lot of hurtful things. He would say things like, you're not that pretty, I don't know why I married you. I don't even know why I had children with you. It got to the point where I wished he would just hit me so that these hurtful words would stop because sometimes words can hurt more than the fist. This went on for almost seven years, excuse me, for seven years. Calling the police was like calling no one. Maxwell had family members who worked in our precinct. Whenever they were called, they would send someone that was related to him, and he was able to walk. The only time he was arrested was one time a new police officer was on duty, and he arrested him. The new police officer had taken him to the precinct, and he was back home in a few hours. When he got home, he was even more furious with me, only thinking about his pride and how bad he was hurt being taken out of his home in handcuffs. Give me a minute, please. He began to beat me. While he was hitting me, he screamed, what are you going to do? They're not going to do anything. As you can see, I'm back. And I could kill you if I wanted to. One of these beatings was so bad, I was in the hospital for almost two months. He was able to conceal the pattern of abuse every time by bringing me to different hospitals using alias names. Every time I went to the hospital for an injury, he was sitting right there next to me. The nurses never asked me if he hit me. The times they asked, I was unable to answer because he was right there. The first person I told was my mother. She told me what happens in your household stays in your household. Sure. I made the mistake of telling someone in my church and Maxwell found out. His response was, don't you ever again in your life go outside of this household and tell anyone what goes on in my home. This is my home and I do whatever the hell I want. In 1995, he slung me down a flight of steps I broke my ankle, I had a fractured wrist and a dislocated shoulder. <clears throat> While I was recuperating from these injuries, I stayed with a friend. He came over and I asked for a divorce. When I got home, he beat me so bad, I thought he was going to kill me, but he didn't. He stated the only way you will ever leave this marriage will be in a body bag. 
One day, he had gotten suspended for drinking on his job and was waiting for me to come home. I walked into the house. He immediately pounced on me. He said, bitch, where the hell you been? He grabbed me and slung me against the wall. He began choking me. I was able to break loose. We started struggling and rolled down the hallway. When we got to the kitchen, he had both of his hands tightly wrapped around my neck. My vision was blurring and everything was going dark. I couldn't breathe. I was fading and beginning to black out. I reached out and found something. At the time, I did not know what it was, but it was a little steak knife. Trying to get him off of me, I stabbed him. He finally let go and I just ran. I ran all the way out of the building into the street. I looked back only one time to see him still chasing me. I ran onto the street and I saw two of my friends and I ran to them and said, oh my God, I just stabbed Maxwell. I hope he doesn't kill me. The police came from everywhere. They grabbed me and threw me up against the fence. They took me to the police station, but they didn't tell me he was dead. I kept asking about my husband. The first officer told me he was in the operating room. Another officer told me he was in the recovery room, and then one told me that he was fine. I was not made aware of his death until I was in central booking and they called my name. They said the charge was murder in the first degree. I was in complete shock and I had no idea my husband was dead. When I finally regained my clarity, I was taken to Rikers Island. No one knew. They didn't contact my family or anyone. The district attorney portrayed me as a drug addicted woman who had gone on a killing spree. He never mentioned the abuse, that we were legally married, that we had children. He never mentioned that there were incidents on police records and medical reports documenting the abuse. During my first trial, the grand jury kept hearing conflicting stories. The DA kept saying one thing while witnesses gave a different story. Although I had close to 75 injuries, the DA said only two of them were suspicious. When, I came to, when it came to the abuse, he kept using words like allegedly. During questioning, the DA asked, if he was beating you as bad as you said, then why didn't you leave? Mm. A lot of people don't know it's very difficult to walk out of a very abusive relationship your batterer is not going to let you just leave. That means he loses his power and control. My friends and neighbors and teachers at my children's school painted a different picture. There was one witness who even stated that he lived next door to me. I don't know anything about domestic violence, but I know he used to beat her up a lot. When the DA represented me as a violent drug addicted woman, my public defender didn't show any initiative the first lawyer never really spoke to me or asked me what happened. One time he even mistook me for another client. To him, I was just a number. My trial ended in a hung jury. After the hung jury, I was assigned an 18B lawyer, and it was only during my second trial when steps to end family violence intervened that domestic violence issues were properly raised. After 80 days of being detained at Rikers Island, steps offered me an alternative to incarceration program that helps women defendants with histories of abuse. STEPS did their own investigation into the abuse. They worked with my new lawyer and helped convince the DA to change his position. During my second trial, I was asked questions I could answer and ones that made me feel like it was not my fault. The DA agreed to charge me with manslaughter in the second degree which was reduced from the charge that was originally brought against me. The charge does not carry a mandatory prison sentence like the charge I was facing at the first time around. I pled guilty and was sentenced to five years probation, conditions on participating in STEPS alternative to incarceration program. I'm very grateful for STEPS. STEPS pushed the alternative to incarceration treatment because they felt the mental health services would be the best treatment for me not medication as a remedy, but a time to heal, recollect, and reflect on what happened. When I first entered STEP, I had no hope, but through this program, I met other women who were experiencing the same emotions as me, who came from a past marked by abuse. After completing their eight-week program where I worked on my self-esteem and rebuilding my confidence, I found my voice to come here today. 
It was only because the district attorney lowered the charge that I was able to get into the program. A judge should have that power or authority to make this type of decision and to send someone to an ATI program if they think it is the most appropriate sentence. I'm not saying I or anyone like me should be exempt from their responsibilities if we committed a crime. But please, please, take into consideration what led to that crime. Find out what factors led to the crime and why they shouldn't be exempt from accountability. The court should take into consideration which led to those actions. From being a victim to becoming a survivor, alternative to incarceration gives a second chance to those who have been brutalized. What happened to, to me is not going to be invalidated or unheard or spoken to deaf ears. Love, kindness, and respect, these should be the main values and that guide our society. And the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act can help orient the criminal justice system in that direction. Thank you for allowing me to share my concerns and issues and being empathetic to my personal tragedy with domestic violence. I was fortunate enough to have intervention from a higher power and I invest in that belief on a daily mm -hmm. basis. When you incarcerate a domestic violence victim, you are, you are re victimizing them through the criminal justice system. It is no way to rebuild a person that has been beaten down, low self esteem, and has no hope for a future. So I come to you and I challenge you, please take this into consideration how many lives will be saved and how many women can regain themselves in this society and be positive role models to their children, their families, and others. Thank you.